after the death of Philip II, who united ancient Greece through the invention of the Macedonian phalanx, his son Alexander the Great picked up where his father left off and began one of the most ambitious and unthinkable revenge campaigns ever documented in human history. By leading his soldiers in numerous battles through hostile terrains for over 10 years, from Macedonia to the foothills of the Himalayas and the Indus River, Alexander the Great caused the collapse of empires and established a rule of his own. The most stunning part of his story, though, is not solely about how capable of a general he was on the battlefield, but also about how convincing he was to himself and to his soldiers in making them believe in what he was doing and be part of his dream, while writing a story more impressive than the heroes he respected. The title of this video is not provocatory. On the contrary, it is meant to analyze how leaders convince themselves and thousands, or even millions of people, to believe in their dreams as if it were theirs. This is the story of Alexander the Great, and this is what drove his ambition. His parents always made him feel special, fueling his sense of grandeur. His father claimed to be a direct descendant of Hercules, the mythical hero who killed the Nemean lion with his bare hands, while his mother claimed to be a direct descendant of Achilles, the mythical hero who fought in the Trojan War mentioned in the Iliad. Alexander killed a lion in his childhood like Hercules. Alexander had a male lover Hephaestion, like Achilles' male lover Patroclus. Alexander and Hephaestion put flowers on the tombs of Achilles and Patroclus when visiting the city of Troy and they honored Protesilos, the first victim in the Iliad. The interest for his mythical past was also fostered by his educator, the famous Greek philosopher Aristotle, who gave a copy of the Iliad to him, a gift so precious to Alexander that he famously placed it every night under his pillow, next to his dagger, while he slept during his campaigns in Asia. Most notably, Alexander always fought on the front line along with his soldiers like Achilles did, and because he thought he was immortal being the son of Zeus. The Greek city-state subjugated by Philip II, father of Alexander, hated the idea of being under Macedonian rule because they perceived Macedonians as barbarians with a weird dialect, always drunk and practicing polygamy, to the point that Demosthenes once described the King Philip II as a miserable Macedonian from a land which previously you could not even buy a decent slave. But one thing, though, was common in the heart of every Greek citizen, from every person all around Greece, was the feeling of revenge and hatred they had in their souls against the Persian Empire, which previously slashed and burned Greece twice during the Greco-Persian Wars. And this shared sentiment of patriotism was the only reason all of Greece was ready to accept Alexander as their ruler. Everyone wished for the destruction of the Persian Empire. According to different sources, Greece in that period had a population of at least 3 million people, while the Persian Empire around 17 million people. Other researchers state that the population of Greece was around 8 million people and that around 35 to 80 million people may have lived in the Persian Empire during the same period with an average of 50 million people. Greece was therefore facing an empire several times more populated and also considerably much richer, very organized and very economically productive, filled with opulent cities guarded by huge numbers of soldiers. The goal of Alexander the Great was so insane and crazy that when he crossed the Bosphorus Strait with 48,000 infantrymen and 6,000 cavalry on board of 100 Tyrimes, the Persian Empire at first did not take him seriously and, as a consequence, lowered its guard. But things immediately turned awful for the Persian Empire when the Macedonian army crushed the Persians in the Battle of Granicus then slowly penetrated into the Persian territory and started to free every city previously under Persian authority, like Miletus and Halicranesus. The Macedonian army one year later utterly defeated the Persians in the Battle of Issus, occupied the city of Tyre, and took over Gaza. When Alexander was crowned pharaoh of Egypt, he marched like his mythical heroes Hercules and Perseus into the desert for 1,000 kilometers, 620 miles, to ask the oracle of Ammon if he was the son of Zeus, since his mother told him she got pregnant with Zeus, who came to her in the shape of a snake. 
And as the oracle answered positively, he was now ready for the most important battle of his life. King Darius III, who already lost huge parts of his empire in three years, was now preparing an army of 250,000 soldiers, or as many as 1 million soldiers, according to Plutarch, to stop Alexander once and for all in the Battle of Guagamela. Modern estimates, though, expect the size of the Persian army in the Battle of Guagamela to have been around 120,000 soldiers strong, and the Macedonian army to have around 47,000 soldiers. The battle was a decisive victory for Greece, in which Alexander gained Babylon, Mesopotamia, and half of Persia, whose losses led to the fall of the Persian Empire. The Persian Empire lost 50,000 soldiers in this battle, while the Macedonian army just 1,000. There were few minor battles in the four years to come, such as the Battle of Axian Defile, the Battle of the Persian Gate, the Siege of Seropolis, the Battle of Jaxartes, and lastly, the Siege of Sogdian Rock, which closed the chapter of the Persian campaign. The Greeks triumphed with honor and glory, and the soldiers received wealthy compensations. Greece accomplished its mission. The Greek dream was finally over. But one man was not happy. Alexander's behavior changed significantly after he conquered the Persian Empire. He was now dressing in extravagant Persian clothes. He married 80 of his closest commanders and 10,000 of his best soldiers to Persian women in one single day. He himself married the daughter of Darius III and then two other Asian women. Alexander was behaving as a Persian king of kings, as a god, and was requesting his Greek soldiers who he held deeply democratic values to bow down to him in a position called proskinesis. Alexander did not know how to explain to his soldiers that there were no more winners and losers, and both Greeks and Persians were now worth the same and had the same rights and duties. They were both servants of Alexander the Great. The more Alexander tried to blend the culture of these two societies together, the more his soldiers felt detached and abandoned by their leader, and they despised him for not valuing the Greek culture of freedom and democracy as superb over the Persian culture of hierarchy and subjugation. From a beloved conqueror, he became a hated god. Although Greece's dream of conquering the Persian Empire was over, Alexander's dream was far from being achieved. Many of his soldiers were disappointed by his behavior, left the army to return to their families, and Alexander was now restructuring his army by substituting the missing soldiers with new Persian soldiers. During the following two years of his campaign, Alexander penetrated into the Indian subcontinent, fighting in the Kapen campaign, conquering Ornos, crushing Poros in the Battle of Hydaspes, hence acquiring Punjab and conquering Multan. But when his soldiers reached the shores of the Indus River, they couldn't find enough reasons and motivations to cross it. The soldiers who previously found meaning and inspiration in Alexander's words, to such an extent that they subjugated the Persian Empire and marched over 20,000 kilometers in 10 years through hostile terrains, such as forests, rivers, hills, mountains, torrid deserts, marched under the sun, the rain, the snow, and marched under incredibly warm and freezing temperatures while wearing heavy equipment, now simply wanted to go back to their families and stop the endless battles. Many of them felt like they were not fighting for their country anymore. They felt like they were fighting for a dream that only Alexander was aware of. And there was nothing that Alexander could say to change their minds. That's when Alexander, the undefeated military genius, had to come back on his steps and abandon his dream of reaching the edge of the unknown world. Two years later, Alexander was on his deathbed in Babylon. One night before sleeping, without anyone knowing, he tried to drag himself to the shores of the Euphrates River, because he felt that gods like him do not die, they disappear. But his wife Roseanne saw him and brought him back to his room. When he died, the legend says that his wife did something typical of the Persian culture. She kissed him on his lips while he was dying to inhale his soul through his last breath. Many people hated him for what he had become. Many people loved him for who he was. Alexander the Great grew up believing he was the son of Zeus, descendant of the mythical hero Hercules, who killed the Nemean lion with his bare hands, and Achilles, the hero of the Iliad, who led to the capitulation of the city of Troy. Alexander the Great always carried with him a copy of the Iliad, to read it and imitate his heroes. Had he not come across the Iliad, Aristotle, 
and parents like his, how would his story be different today? To be honest, the mythical hero Achilles conquered a city, but a real man, Alexander the Great, established an empire from Greece to the foothills of the Himalayas and the Indus River. The real story of this man surpasses the literary fantasy of his heroes. Did you enjoy this video? If yes, please click on the right or the left to see one more. Have a good day.